All right. So we have um, all sorts of stuff to talk about today. And, um, all, you know, as always, as, as our guest, you're welcome to take this wherever you want to take it. I, I did want to talk about your book, The Principles of Economics. Um, I would love to talk a, a bit about um, the Bitcoin parallel economy and, and, and a few other things. But again, the most interesting conversations are when our guests feel free to just go as they please. So by all means, feel free to answer these questions however you'd like to. Um, if you guys are in the audience, please give this this space a repost. Let's get as many people in here as possible and uh, we'll make this fun. I mean, this is a great opportunity to uh, sit down and, and, and hear from somebody that I think probably had a lot of influence on a lot of us, whether it's through reading the Bitcoin standard, uh, fiat standard. Um, I have to say those were both great books. I don't know if it's okay to say my to have you guys on with. of economics was phenomenal. Like, I mean, it was, it, it, it may be my uh, favorite economics book of all time. And I think it's because you, you hit the principles and it, it was one of those things where it's so fresh to go back to the basics. Um, can I ask why did you choose to write principles of economics after what some might consider like a more advanced form of economics in the Bitcoin standard and the fiat standard? First of all, let me just uh, say that I think I agree with you. Um, if I were to assess the three objectively, I'd say the principles of economics is probably the best of the three as uh, a, as a book. And I think the, the the proof of work is a part of it. Obviously, as an Austrian economist, if you read the book, you know that uh, I don't believe in the labor theory of value. So it's not just that if you put more work into it, it's going to be a better book. But uh, it's not necessarily the case, but it usually happens to be that way when you work hard at something, it turns out better. And I think I worked, I'm pretty sure I spent more time working on principles of economics than I did on the Bitcoin standard and the fiat standard combined. Might even be more than uh, twice the time that I spent on both of them. So I, I've worked on principles of economics really from 2019 up until 2023, so about four years during which time I got the idea for uh, the fiat standard and I wrote the fiat standard and published it and I was still working on principles of economics throughout it so it took a lot of time uh, to write it and I'm uh, glad that uh, you liked it I'm glad that a lot of people seem to like it um, and it's 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 a lot less polarizing than uh, the Bitcoin standard uh, so a lot of people don't like the Bitcoin standard as you can imagine because Bitcoin is polarizing but this one I think anybody who's uh, interested in reading about Austrian economics is already um, is already open-minded to the idea, and they're not going to be hostile to it like with Bitcoin. So it did get, I would say, a lot more positive uh, feedback. Having said that, I think um, the reason that I wrote it is that I've always wanted to write this book. I wanted to write this book before I knew about Bitcoin. I wanted to write this book back when I was in grad school. And I started learning Austrian economics, and I started trying to teach economics. Actually, not since grad school. Since I finished grad school, went to work at a university and started to teach there. I wanted to teach economics that was not um, <laughs> nonsense in the Keynesian tradition. And it was very difficult, because all the textbooks are made by Keynesians. And uh, the uh, curriculum is set up by Keynesians. And if you're trying to teach the Austrian uh, perspective, uh, you need to effectively rig together uh, a bunch of books and uh, chapters and articles from here and there and trying to make a syllabus, which is okay, but it's not ideal for a course because uh, you, you can't really get the best insight from a chapter that you're reading separately rather than... Um, taking the chapter from within a sequence of a whole book that you're reading, um, which flows logically. So I've always wanted to do that. And I've had an outline for something like this written up back in maybe 2011, 2010 or something like that. But these were my fiat days. I was still a fiat person. There was still no Bitcoin in my life. And I hadn't... Uh, Bitcoin hadn't fixed me yet, and so I was one of those people who has a lot of ideas about books he wants to write someday, and uh, you know, just like I'm going to get to the gym someday, and I'm going to uh, do all these things someday, and that book was one of them, and it was uh, something that I wanted to do, but then Bitcoin comes along, 
And then suddenly I discovered the ability to write. I lowered my time preference and I can sit down and actually write things and uh, have the focus and the time preference to work on a long-term project that takes a lot of time to complete and doesn't offer immediate satisfaction. And so initially you start off by writing the Bitcoin standard. And then when that worked out and that uh, became quite successful, I decided I don't want to be teaching at a university. I want to be teaching online. I mean, I saw that the future is heading online. Everything's going online. Money is going online. Education is going online. And I thought it would be a waste of time to continue to tie myself to a brick and mortar university selling uh, certificates when I could be focusing on actually teaching people useful things because I found that there's a readership that cares to read what I write. And so I thought, yeah, I need to finally work on that book. And so I started on it as soon as I finished the Bitcoin standard um, or a few months later and then uh, worked on it ever since. And it's really the book that I want my kids to read to learn economics. It's, I mean, there's, there are so many great Austrian books, but unfortunately there isn't a, a great readable textbook that I can recommend to people in good conscience. I mean, the, um, the, the obvious answer among Austrians is to say, read Human Action by Mises, which is a great book. Or I read Man, Economy, and State by Rothbard, which is also a great book. But honestly, I can't in good conscience recommend these books to uh, civilians who are not into Austrian economics. I mean, they are extremely heavy, and they spend way too much time getting bogged down in academic debates and academic discussions and trying to refute the dominant mainstream narrative. And at some point, the, you, you can see why they had to do this because they were writing those books in, in the case of Mises, it was in the 40s, I think, and in Rothbard's case, it was in the 60s or 70s. So at that time, you had to write within the university system, you had to write for other academics, and you had to fight with the establishment to try and get your uh, um, ideas across. But now it's a very different world uh, because of the internet and because of Bitcoin. We do have an independent world that doesn't even care about what's going on in universities. And therefore, you don't have to waste the reader's time with page after page after page after page of academic nonsense and uh, irrelevant debates and trying to explain to them why this thing is wrong and why this obscure economist that they're never going to ever hear about again is wrong about something that they had never even considered before. You could just skip all of that and jump straight to the meat of the matter. Just get straight to the real points that you want to communicate. What is capital? What is trade? Why do people trade? What is money? How does money work? What is time preference? What is... Uh, for, what, what do we mean by economic freedom? What do we mean by consent? What do we mean by free exchange? All of these extremely important concepts that you learn from economics, which you would be doing a huge disservice to if you had um, spent half the book trying to argue the counterpoints, which are really, um, I mean, largely incoherent, and they, they, they don't merit a lot of debunking. So I wanted to write this book so that we could present the Austrian perspective unapologetically, not sitting there and saying, no, here's why we believe the Austrian view on things, and here's why the Keynesians are wrong. I'm just going to get to the point. I want to get to the reader the idea of why, what capital is, why capital matters, how capital is accumulated, the relationship between capital and time preference, all of these very important concepts that I think people really benefit a lot from learning. Um, and... It's, um, as, as I say, academic economics is like a distributed denial of service attack on people's ability to understand economics because they're just flooding the world with all of these irrelevant papers and theories. And if you try and learn it, if you go to university, you find yourself wasting so much time trying to make sense of their theories. And if you do understand them, the only thing you get out of it is that, okay, well, you understood this theory. But that has no relevance to your world. It's like you understood uh, Lord of the Rings or some work of fiction. Yeah, so in this world, this is the way that the 
elves or whatever function. But how's that going to help you with the real world? It doesn't. But this is economics for the real world. Well, you just teed up my next three questions. Like you covered my next three questions to some degree in that. Um, but I've, I've actually seen you do this in your interviews. I'm thinking back to the Lex Friedman interview that you did where he really kept kind of prompting you to say, uh, steel man, the, the, the uh, Keynesian theory or, you know, the, or the labor theory of value or whatever it happens to be. And you, you really didn't let yourself get bogged down in explaining the other side, the merits of it. You just explained why this thing works. And I think that that's what your, I mean, your book is what quite long, what 400 pages, but yes, none of it feels like, like fat. I mean, it really feels like it's the portion or, you know, excess or whatever. It, it really is. This is capital. This is what this is. And, and it, it chains together very well. And that's very readable um, for anybody that, that hasn't. I mean, it just makes you feel like, okay, I, I, I want to turn the next page because I just digested information. I didn't think there was three pages where it was kind of teeing up a point that was coming. It's like every page has a point. Every page has something that's consumable. Um, but one of the things that you mentioned was your, your children. It's that you wrote the book that you want your children to read someday. Um, that was literally my next question. I, I, my children will read this book. I have four children. We, we homeschool all four of them. My oldest two are 10. Um, so I, we, we talk about these things, but I don't know if, if they would be, they're, they're pretty advanced readers. I don't think they'd be able to read it yet. For you, what age do you imagine your children would read this at? Or what, what age do you imagine children should start to be exposed to this type of thing? Honestly, it's a difficult question for me to answer. My oldest is only eight, so I, I can tell you that eight is too early. Um, uh, but I, I don't remember when I would have been able to read this and understand it. I mean, definitely by freshman year of college, I think most students should be able to understand this by the time they're in freshman. But then before that, I think it depends on just how precocious the kid is, how curious the kid is, and how... Uh, how much they can sit down and read something that takes a lot of time to digest. I think uh, it's it, it, it's not entirely um, unthinkable that a 15-year-old could read it. A bright 15-year-old, I think, should be able to read it, maybe even 14. Yeah, I, I agree. I think that makes sense. That That's kind of what I had in my mind. And uh, hopefully this is a, this is a, a big compliment. I mean, I uh, there's there's... Uh, several things that my children need to do uh, before they uh, before they're, they they can leave my household, or that I want them to be prepared with before they leave my house. And uh, one of the things is, is that they have to become at least a jujitsu blue belt. Uh, they have to become a jujitsu blue belt because that essentially means that you can defend yourself from a bigger, stronger opponent. And now our our official family list actually has principles of economics on that list. So so along wow. with a few a few other things, <laughs> principle of economics is actually part of my my children's mandated curriculum before they're they're uh, off to to either career college whatever they want to do after they're eighteen. So um, that's yeah. a brilliant idea. I'd love to take a look at that list and maybe devise one for myself. I, I like the idea. Oh uh, well, thank you. I'd, I'd be happy to send send it over. Um, and just thinking back to, to what you were saying earlier, too, I think it was probably pretty pretty shocking for most of the audience to think that at some point, uh, Saifedean, who we, we think of as this you know prolific Bitcoin author, at some point, you were just a guy that, that had ideas for books you wanted to write someday. And it's like, what's the difference between uh, Saifedean at that point and Saifedean today? It was, you just, you did it. You didn't ask anybody for permission to write a book. You, you sat down and started doing it. I mean, you, like you said, it was the proof of work. And I think that's just a really good lesson for anybody in the audience who has these ideas. They want to start a business. They want to build a, build an app. They want to write a book. They want to start a blog, whatever it happens to be. You really don't need that to ask anybody for permission. If you've got good ideas, start putting them out there. And I think that that's a big part of this Bitcoin social layer that we're talking about is Bitcoiners all doing their part uh, to, to contribute to the the economy of ideas, the econ the actual parallel economy, all sorts of things. Um, but I wanted to. But I will really add. I, I, I will add. Uh, it's, it's it's not just that I sat down and did it. I think there are two other factors that uh, made the difference. Number one is Bitcoin. So before Bitcoin, I just had a very high time preference, and I was uh, unable to commit to long term projects or to commit to any kind of long term anything, basically. 
And Bitcoin allows you to do that because Bitcoin makes you think, well, now I have a way for saving for the future. So and then, well, what am I going to do with the future? What am I going to do uh, to make my future better other than just stack sats for it? So you start thinking long term. And also Bitcoin from a professional perspective, which is before Bitcoin, I was stuck at a university job and I had to try and keep my job. And the way to keep my job is to try and publish in these academic journals, which nobody reads, which publish completely unreadable nonsense. And I was lost, struggling, trying to communicate my ideas, which are outside of the mainstream, to the mainstream, and struggling to communicate to those people and um, you know, not, not even uh, being able to communicate in the same language that they use. And then Bitcoin comes along, and I realized that, you know what, no, I, I don't need this stuff. I can say for the future myself, I don't need to be working a... Uh, essentially a slave fiat job and I can uh, become independent and I can become, be become an independent author and just sell my books for Bitcoin online and sell my courses for Bitcoin online. And then the second thing, I got to say, I, this was a huge difference for me. It's meat. I moved to an all meat diet. All these three books were written on an all meat diet and they would not have been written without me being a carnivore. If I was still eating sugar, I would not have had the focus and the attention span to be able to sit and write down these things. So, uh, yeah, I mean, it's great to have the idea that, yeah, just do it, but also you need meat and Bitcoin. Don't kid yourself. <laughs> Thank you for clarifying that. So, yeah, you need people need to not ask for permission and they need to go out to get some Bitcoin and eat some meat. All right, we, we got the, the three points there. appreciate you <laughs> clarifying that. But, uh, yeah, so, I mean, it brings me to my next question is what – economic principles do you see bitcoiners kind of consistently getting wrong whether it's in twitter or if you want you know you see and i'm not talking about the cnbc anchor that's talking about bitcoin but i'm saying people that are bitcoin maxis that we're out here talking about it that that bitcoiners are consistently yeah maybe we're missing the bar a little bit on this do you see kind of a common thread or is, is it all over the place or are bitcoiners kind of knocking it out of the park where, where do you think we are on that you know on that grade hmm Honestly, on the spot, I can't really think of anything um, in particular that stands out. I mean, I'm sure that a lot of people have mistaken ideas about economics, but as a kind of pervasive problem among Bitcoiners, uh, systematic problem, I think, I can't think of anything. I think because once you've undone the brainwashing necessary to make you think that government control of money is necessary for money to work, that's 90% of the fallacies shaken just right there. 90% uh, of the fallacies fall apart and then whatever remains is uh, every, you know, every individual will have their own quirky uh, fallacies left over. But I can't think of something systematic, honestly. I'll, uh, maybe, maybe during the discussion later on I'll uh, think of something and I'll bring it up. Well, that, that makes me happy that we're doing a relatively good job, that we're not a bunch of buffoons out here <laughs> saying a bunch of idiotic stuff. So, yeah, I mean, I think that I, for, I know for me that engaging with other Bitcoiners has always been kind of a refining process. And, I, you know, I know obviously we're not perfect, but, yeah, it definitely seems like most Bitcoiners I meet have a pretty robust understanding of, of um, generally, you know, economic principles and things like that. But it, it's, all, it's also one of those things where um, I think we benefit from, a book that that takes the deep dive. Maybe maybe Bitcoiners. Maybe we were we were comfortable talking about um, you know subjective value and, and those types of things, but we weren't we weren't comfortable talking about something as simple as what makes capital. Um, and so we have we can sit down across the table from from general economic economists and have a uh, a rational conversation. And I think it really allows us to unwind. Um, more Keynesian arguments and things like that as we do it. Um, but I also want to ask too, because I want a little bit of a framing for, you know, as, as I read your book, it just, it feels so matter of fact. And I think you do a great job about that of, uh, again, not constantly trying to answer all the challenges of the other side, but just literally explaining rationally why things are the way they are. Um, but what is your kind of ethical framework um what do, do you i don't know are you do you fancy yourself as like a spiritual person are you a religious person person do you have a code of ethics do you do you have any kind of creed that you live by or that helps dictate your 
ethical values, moral values, or whatever you want to call it? So I think the book, I was just discussing it yesterday uh, on an interview with uh, Cedric Youngerman, um, and I, he was saying repeatedly, uh, he, he's a very astute reader, I always love being interviewed by him, and he was saying that he, he noticed that the book was, you know, you, you come into the book thinking it's just all going to be money and economics, but you end up with a, a lot of lessons about morality, and I think that's very accurate, because uh, what I come to as a conclusion from reading Mises and the Austrians is that libertarianism is not just this idea that I want to be selfish, I want to just look out for myself. It's really the working solution for us as human beings to be able to live together in a society. It's the only way that we can have a society that scales, and it's the only way that humans can live with each other and advance beyond the state of essentially being monkeys in the jungle, jungle flinging our own feces at each other. To the extent that we can move out of the jungle and develop more complex tools than just flinging our own feces at each other, uh, develop tools for hunting and building homes and protecting ourselves from animals and from the environment and from nature and being able to provide for ourselves in sickness being able to have reliable supplies of food, to the extent that we can do all of that, the, the extent to which we can do all of that is the extent to which we are able to respect each other's property in ourselves and in our physical objects that we legitimately own. And this is really something that comes out as a very profound conclusion from reading all of these economic issues. And if you don't really understand economics, then this might appear as if it is just libertarians being selfish. And I think, to be fair, that that is a fair criticism of a lot of uh, libertarians, particularly, for instance, if you think about uh, Ayn Rand's philosophy, which does uh, uh, um, explicitly say that it is a philosophy of selfishness, and it's, it's all about self-actualization. And make of that what you may, and self-actualization is good, being selfish is uh, maybe you like it, but that is the, the extremely distinct and different from the Austrian approach. The Austrian approach is an approach of property rights. And it's property rights, A, from a perspective of self-interest, you want to have property because having things is good, it's better than not having things, it's good to have a house that you could go to every day rather than try and find a place in the wild to sleep when you get tired. It's good that you have a place where you can have your food. It's good that you have a reliable way of securing your food. And all of that requires property, and it requires stable property rights that the people around you respect and don't violate. Because if everybody's going to start violating everybody's property rights every time they feel like it, we won't be able to be have any houses. We won't be able to invest in any of those things. As I said earlier, we'll just be monkeys in the jungle flinging our feces at each other. So, to, to be, uh, from, a, from an individual selfish perspective, yeah, you want to have that. But even more importantly, from a societal perspective, if you want to live around human beings and not be in constant struggle and not die young and not get brutally injured very young, you need to accept that you have to accept that other peoples have property and they have legitimate property. And you can't treat other people's bodies and other people's objects and property as your own, and you have to respect that they control them. And this is it. This is why we have nice things. This is the only way that we can have nice things. Without that, everything goes to shit. Without that, everything falls apart. Nothing can function if we don't respect that. And to the extent that we have any kind of nice thing anywhere in the world, it's because people respect property rights. And in places, the more, the more people respect property rights, the more peaceful and productive a society is, the more secure people are there in their property, and the more they are able to think of the long term and have a lower time preference and accumulate capital and increase their productivity. And when property rights are not secure, the exact opposite happens. People are constantly engaged in struggle. People are constantly hurting each other and fighting and killing each other. And people have no scope for thinking of the long term. And it makes no sense to think of the long term. Why would you sacrifice today for the future 10 years from now when the future is highly uncertain? Why would you invest in a farm or a house or a factory 
if you know that at any point in time somebody can come and take these things from you. So only when we have this idea, this idea of respect of property rights, only then can we have a workable solution. And that, in turn, endangers the low time preference that allows us to think about the long term and really marks us as different from animals who are incapable of uh, thinking about their long-term needs and are constantly subject to their short-term desires and their instinctive desires. We as human beings, we have reason. And then this is a key quote from Mises in the book that man is not a slave to his base instinctive desires. Man can curb that, those things. And man does not just jump on every woman that uh, he finds attractive. He does not just try and punch and kill every man that bothers him in any way. He does not just reach out and take everything that he thinks is nice. You'd learn to curb those desires, and because you curb those desires, you're able to have civilized society, and you're able to think of the long term, and you're able to provide for the long term, and this is what allows us to have a low time preference. And when you understand it that way, you can see how you can see, I mean, one of the conclusions, or two of the conclusions that I reach, arrive at at the late chapters of the book, and I'm really not doing it much justice here because I build up to this over uh, 18 chapters, is that these institutions that we have in our society of religion and family, you can understand their popularity and their survival, and the fact that everywhere we go in the world, people have some form of religion and people have the family as a unit, they are extremely useful because they help people to have a low time preference. They teach you to keep a low time preference, and that's essential for us to be able to live together in a society. So when you have a family, you have children, you start realizing on a very basic biological level, I mean, your children are quite literally a, a part of you. And it's, uh, it's not just emotionally a part of you, they're literally a part of you. There was a physical part of your body that grew into a child. And so naturally, you're very attached to that part of your body and you want it to do well, just like you care about yourself. And similarly, um, you have the same feeling towards... Um, so that, that, that idea gives, gives you the incentive to think about the long term and to become more and more careful about your decisions and your actions and to plan them for the long term. So you see why family is important for civilization, for peaceful coexistence, for humanity to have nice things, for us to be able to get out of the jungle. And you also see the same thing about, uh, you can see the same thing with, uh, with religion. Religion also helps us do the same thing. Religions, edicts, all religions can best be understood as ways of lowering your time preference. You want to care about the afterlife. You don't want to just care about today. You don't want to do the bad things that involve your base desires. You don't want to do all of the bad things that are... If you think about what are the bad things that religion tells you not to do, they're things that feel good in the moment. They're things that you have an overwhelming desire that you want to do. You want to assault somebody. You want to kill somebody. You want to uh, rape somebody. And it tells you those things are bad or you shouldn't do them because there's a short-term benefit from them, there's a short-term pleasure from them, but then there's a long-term detrimental effect that they have on you, that they have on society, that they have on other people. And so this is, this is why I think economics is extremely important, not just because it's a way of understanding money or it's a way of understanding how you can make more money. I think material reality is very pervasive across all of all aspects of life and it helps you understand all of these aspects much better when you understand how human beings act and the incentives that human beings act toward and how human beings make their decisions so i mean we've all seen that i mean what you're saying about the family and it lowering your time preference i mean we, we've all seen the guy from high school that was a complete party animal just crazy living life on the edge and then he has a kid at some point and all of a sudden you see him 10 years later and he's he's in a suit and tie he's mr respectable i mean it just it has a way of completely turning people around from the crazy people we are as a, as a young man 
or young woman to, you know, the adult responsible person that's able to put food on the table. Because yes, I mean, there's something, it's something beyond them. And I kid you not, Safedine, my next question, I mean, we, you and I, we're on the same wavelength here. My next question, I was going to quote Mises, the quote, the exact quote you did. I'm going to, I'm going to reread it for the audience. Um, and then the question I have at the end is, so what, why is human action regaining popularity in economics? And so, and just, I guess, more broadly uh, across the world. So that quote from Mises specifically was, man is a being capable of subduing, uh, of subduing his instincts, emotions, and impulses. He can rationalize his, his behavior. He renounces the satisfaction of a burning impulse in order to satisfy other desires. He is not a puppet of his appetites. A man does not ravish every female that stirs his senses. He does not devour every piece of food that entices him. He does not knock down every fellow he would like to kill. He arranges his wishes and desires in a scale. He chooses. In short, he acts. So, yeah. Why, why is this concept of lowering time preference not killing the guy that you want to you want to kill right now why is that becoming popular but but why is it becoming popular in economics i mean is it is this just because of bitcoin or is there a a, a renaissance happening in culture more broadly i think bitcoin is a big part of it but i also think the internet in general is a big part of it the internet is just allowed for the communication of information outside of the scope of gatekeepers and I think this is huge because uh, up until the internet came about, it was very difficult to get a publishing house to publish a book. You had to get into the publishing academic mafia. And the academic uh, publication mafia is intricately tied to the university system. And the university system is intricately tied to the Federal Reserve. And it's funded by the Federal Reserve. So. It was very difficult for people like Rothbard and Mises to have mass circulation for their books. But Rothbard wrote books in the 50s and 60s that are being read today by thousands and thousands of people. And you think about the most famous economists who were alive back in the 50s and 60s. You know, Paul Samuelson and uh, who even knows... Um, none of these people, nobody reads any of their books. There isn't anybody. You'll, you'll never run into a normal person who says, I picked up a book by Samuelson from the 50s and I learned something interesting. Nobody reads any of that stuff anymore. The internet has made it easier to find the works of everybody. And for me, I mean, I've been following this space for now, say, about 15 years, or 16 years, since I first came across, no, wait, 17, we're in 2024 now. So, yeah, 17 years. Uh, since I've first come across the Austrian economists. And I've seen how much they've grown in popularity. And I think it's it's remarkable because they've massively overtaken any of the other mainstream economists. So if you go and you look at the Amazon bestseller list, you'll see that uh, books by Mises, Rothbard, uh, Hayek, Old books, 50, 60, 70 year old books are still there and thereabouts in the top 100 or so in the best sellers on money or economics or these various topics. And of course, these books are available for download for free from the Mises Institute, which has an enormous number of uh, resources available. Um, so even, even though they're available for free, people still continue to buy them much more than the mainstream books. And I think another very interesting data point uh, I've been following the bestseller list because my books are on it, so I, I check it maybe once a week or so, and I'm always looking at it. And it's really fascinating, but if you look for over the last four years or so, maybe four is too much, maybe two or three years, I'd say, if you look at the top bestsellers on money, it's almost usually always dominated by Austrian-leaning books or alternative books or books that are at least not very Keynesian. So the big ones are The Creature from Jekyll Island by Edward Griffin. My book, The Bitcoin Standard, is always there and uh, up there. And then, you know, when, when a new book by Paul Krugman comes out, like it's up there in the charts for a couple of weeks, you know, high-time preference uh, authors with high-time preference books, they're basically almost like newspaper editorials. They're in the news for a couple of weeks. The New York Times features them, and they talk about how important it is as a revelation because it says 
uh, you know, Republicans are bad, and here's why Republicans are bad, and here's why you should vote for this guy and not vote for that guy. But then six months later, nobody remembers the book. Nobody reads it. And that applies to books like Ben Bernanke's book as well. I mean, he was chairman of the Fed. Who the hell has ever read his book? Nobody cares. It's also a bunch of um, corporate speak that doesn't teach you anything. I mean, if you're curious about him as a person, if you're curious about the little intricate details that you're allowed to know about how he acted, you might want to pick it up, but you're not going to learn anything very useful for life, anything actionable, anything that's going to help you in life. And I think this is very telling because people who read books are generally, I would say, significantly more intelligent, lower time preference, more capable of committing to long-term projects, more thoughtful, more critical in their understanding. And I think it speaks volumes that Amazon, which and we're talking here about Amazon US, so mainstream media in the US is constantly churning out an endless stream of Keynesian uh, propaganda books out for everybody to read into the newspapers and the universities and the TV and Hollywood is all in agreement on all of these uh, broad outlines of the Keynesian propaganda. And yet people who read just end up going to the quality stuff. And I think Bitcoin's a part of it, but I just think it's the internet allowing people to, uh, allowing authors to establish their worth out there on a free market. Everybody gets a book listed on Amazon and then everybody, you know, every people are going to read all of the books and then they're going to start rating them and they're going to start recommending them. They're going to start blogging about them. They're going to start telling their friends about them and the cream rises to the top and the, um, non cream doesn't. And most of the books that are just repeating the statist propaganda fade into obscurity over time. And the books that provide quality seem to continue to stick around. And I think you're going to see this continue to be the case. And I think uh, this is a little bit of giving away my uh, uh, <laughs> ulterior motives here. But I, I think, uh, I'm not sure of this, but I've looked around. I've never seen a book in economics, an economics book, that has more reviews on Amazon than the Bitcoin standard. So, of course... There are books that have a lot more reviews and ratings that are uh, books about money, about business, uh, some of these self-help books. Of course, these are extremely popular. So the Bitcoin stand is almost at 7,000 uh, reviews and ratings on Amazon. I've not come across a single economics book that has a higher rating. And if you look at economics textbooks, they usually have something like 200 ratings or something like that. Uh, people are assigned those books at universities. They read them. And they take the exam. Nobody ever, or very few people ever feel compelled to go on Amazon and post a positive review about the book because it's it doesn't matter. It's just a curriculum that you had to do and you didn't really learn much from it. You just got the grade that you needed. So that was part of the motivation for writing this book when I realized that, look, I've already got a, a, a significant readership that appreciates this, that is keeping my book near the top of the bestsellers charts on Amazon for money. It's been there for now, it's going to be uh, six years, yes. It'll be uh, six years in uh, April. And it's been, I'd say, consistently in the top, definitely top 10 and for very long periods in the top three of the bestsellers on money. So people that are looking for books on money are just getting recommended the Bitcoin standard all the time by Amazon. And I thought I wanted to do the same thing with principles of economics because I could write a textbook and if people like it, they're going to go online and they're going to post a lot of reviews for it. And then it's just going to rise to the top of the rankings of textbooks. And when people want to read textbooks, they're going to go for this rather than whatever their university recommended, which they found to be useless. So that's kind of the long-term play here. I love it. You're subverting their whole model. You're kind of backdooring them with that. I like that. Um, yeah. So I want to, I want to change gears a bit, um, but kind of little, uh, little segue here. Um, for those of you guys that are just tuning in to the space, this is brought to you by the Orange Pill app. This, uh, this has been a really big week for Orange Pill app. Um, we've been around for, for a bit over a year. We have 9,000 plebs that have connected through the app. It's a, it, it's a social network 
designed to connect you with other Bitcoiners in your area. I think that's one of the common complaints of Bitcoiners is that they don't, they just don't know any other Bitcoiners, especially in real life. And so part of the brilliance of the app was to connect people with their local Bitcoin crew. Now, one of the things that launched this week, which is like the biggest step forward that we that we can we, that we can think of in terms of hyper Bitcoinization or taking a step toward hyper Bitcoinization, was the launch of our merchant section. Um, any brick and mortar businesses around the world can go in and create a uh, create an account so that Bitcoiners in their area can more easily find them. Uh, so if you're a brick and mortar business. Go to the orangepillapp.com slash merchants and register your business there. Again, brick and mortar businesses who accept Bitcoin are, it's kind of, that's, that's the check mark for, for qualification. Imagine the types of economic connections we can, we can make when you, it's not just only Bitcoin spent online. Like that's, that's a beautiful solution. We, we all shop online. We need to be able to spend Bitcoin online, but being able to spend Bitcoin and in person at the taco shop down the street, or if you're going to buy some steak from your local rancher, those are the type of economic connections that make the Bitcoin social layer more anti-fragile than ever before. So if you're a merchant or, well, if you're a merchant, go to the orangepillapp.com slash merchants. Or if you're just a pleb who wants to connect with other Bitcoiners or potentially find Bitcoin businesses near you, just go into the App Store or the Google Play Store and get signed up as an individual as well. So back to... Um, what we were talking about. One one last question on the book, and then I kind of want to take this in, in, in more in the direction of kind of the parallel economy, what we were talking about there for a second. Um, and I don't know if you're willing to share this or if this is meant to, to be a secret or if this is something for the reader to uncover as they go through the book. But in the, in the dedication of the book, you write, to my father, who taught me the most important lesson of this book before I could even read. Do you mind sharing explicitly what that lesson is or is that something that the reader should just garner after reading the book oh sorry i was muted oh yeah well uh let, let me first finish the dedication so that's you just said the first half of it which is uh to my father who taught me the most important lesson in this book before i could read and to my son so that he too may learn it and uh, this really is uh, related to what we were discussing earlier about um, the moral lesson of the book which is respect for property rights lower time preference family all of these things and it's it's really something that uh, s um, stuck with me because when i was a kid i always used to remember that my dad used to tell me the one person in the world that you always want to be better than you is your child. And he would always tell me, you, nobody, nobody's happy to see somebody become better than them except their child. Not only that, your life is only a success if you can give your child a better life than the one that your father gave you. And he would always tell me this since I was a little kid. He's always telling me my challenge is to give you a life better than the one that my father gave me. And I want you to give your son a life that is better than the one that uh, I will give you. That's the challenge. And I mean, as a little kid, I always thought, wow, that's puzzling. I mean, here I am, I'm just a five-year-old who likes ice cream and football. And there's this fully grown surgeon who's out there saving people's lives every day. And he's telling me that me, little utterly insignificant me with my ice cream and football, is the most important thing in his life and making me better than him is the most important thing in his life. So obviously it gives you a lot of food for thought and it makes you think a lot about it. Why would he do this? And I only truly understood it after learning Austrian economics, after reading Mises, after reading the Austrian, <clears throat> I'm sorry, after reading the Austrians, because they help you really put this in perspective, that this is essentially what human civilization is about. If we are living in a civilization, if we are a civilized society, then we can expect that over time, we accumulate more capital, we lower our time preference, we create better material conditions, and each generation is able to bequeath the next generation a better life. That's the process of civilization. We are constantly improving our life, and if we do that, we improve our life not just in a 
um, material sense, which might seem like it is superficial, you know, you have more money than your dad, but it's not that superficial because what it means is you are able to secure yourself and secure your life in a way that is better than what your dad had available for him. And so you're less likely to suffer from catastrophes, you're less likely to suffer from um, disease, want, natural disasters, all of these bad things that happen to us. I mean, for people in the rich world, perhaps they money might seem like a trivial material thing, but for the vast majority of humanity, material well-being is intimately connected to survival. And it's really a battle for survival. And so you're out there trying to survive and trying to give your children a better life. That's what all humans have struggled to do, or the majority of humans have struggled to do throughout all of their life. And I think it's, it's, it's really an important lesson to learn about why family is so important and why it's the bedrock of human civilization. Because if everybody has a child and everybody is concerned about the life of their child, well, then everybody has a low time preference. Everybody is thinking about their actions in terms of the long term. And people are less likely to be impulsive, less likely to be violent, less likely to engage in things that are destructive to them on the long term, as we were mentioning earlier. And so that is, for me, the lesson that I take from this book in a, in a, in a very practical sense. It's... It, it, you know, it's not a get-rich-quick book. It's not how to make money. It's a, a guide to how to be part of a civilization and how to thrive in civilization and um, how, how to make it so that you can understand what is the importance of civilization and how you can play your part in helping civilization because you cannot take that for granted. And I think what we're seeing right now all over the world is, to a very large extent, the opposite of that, we're seeing a process of decivilization take place. So one small metric to think about here is how much harder it is for the average 25-year-old American today to buy a house than it was for his father or his grandfather. Because back then, the money wasn't broken. And so people in the 40s and 50s, I mean, it was relatively broken, but it was a lot less broken than it is now. People in the 40s and 50s started working mowing lawns or selling lemonade stands at age 12, and they saved up their money, and the money continued to appreciate in value, and then they got a job at 18, and then by 22, they could afford to get at their own house. And that's just unthinkable right now. And it's unthinkable because we've been decivilizing for a few decades. There's all kinds of propaganda out there trying to cope with this and trying to rationalize it and trying to tell you, yeah, but look, you know, we have um, flat screen TVs that are so cheap and technology is so much nicer. Well, yeah, that's nice, but there's no escaping the fact that the money is broken and the fact that the money is broken means that we are decivilizing. And that's making it harder and harder for us to give our children a better life. It's making it harder for people to save for the future. It's making it harder for people to think of the long term. And it's causing us to become more high time preference, causing us to prioritize the, the present over the future a lot more. And I think you see this all over the world. And I, you know, the, in the last chapter, the last chapter is called Civilization. And I make the case for why fiat money is destroying civilization. It's, it's creating a process of decivilization. And you see it across all of facets of life all facets of civilization, you see how it's destroying the family, how it's destroying people's ability to save, how it's endangering, engendering war and conflict all over the world because of the government's ability to print money and finance all these criminal armies all over the world to go around and murder and do horrible things. It is de-civilization and there's no amount of fancy flat screen TVs that can uh, sugarcoat this. And it's that's why I think this book is, if I may say so myself, what is important about it, I think, the reason I think it is important is because we cannot just take civilization as something for granted. We are, in many ways, witnessing civilizational decline and perhaps civilizational collapse as well. And if we don't get our act together, it's only going to get worse. And this isn't something to celebrate, and this isn't something to be edgy about, as in, in, you know, a lot of people have this kind of 
yes, you know, accelerate, let's bring about the collapse. No, it's, you know, the collapse is not going to be nice. It's going to be horrible. And there's no way to just collapse back to, say, 1975 and live like we did in 1975 or 45 or whatever. We will, we, the, the further it goes, the further we go back to being animals in the jungle. And it wouldn't be the first civilization that collapses and leads to people going uh, back to the jungle, essentially losing everything, losing our culture, losing the material things that we take for granted. And I think uh, we need to fix this. And the way to fix this, obviously, as I are, I mean, I, I'd say the problem is fiat and the problem is central banking and the problem is governments. And I think the solution, obviously, clearly is Bitcoin. It's the technological solution. It's, it's the way that human civilization and the way that capitalism is finding the solution for this threat. All of human history is humans coming across foes and enemies that want to destroy us. And we use our reason and we use our ability to cooperate with one another, the division of labor, and we use capital and we use technology to find those solutions. It was true for the lions and the bears that used to attack us. It's true for um, floods, and it's true for heat waves, and it's true for um, inclement weather, for all kinds of natural disasters. We always find a way. We, you know, I mean, we don't always find a way. Obviously, a lot of people perish along the way. A lot of people do get mauled by bears and lions. But we found a way to tame all of those things. And we're always using our reason and using technology and using capital and using the division of labor and using this edifice that is civilization, which is our super power as humanity. We're always using this in order to defeat our enemies, defeat the things that threaten our well-being. And I believe this is what Bitcoin is. Bitcoin is the culmination of the pinnacle of all of our technological achievements in order to solve the true problem that the world faces, which is fiat money and central banking. That's powerful. That's, that's very powerful. Um, one note, you, you mentioned the affordability of houses and just, uh, I was, I was writing I, my, my new books coming out in a couple months called parallel, a dissertation on the Bitcoin social layer. It's about, it's the case for the parallel economy. Um, and I was writing about that exact, that exact thing. Uh, our grandparents' generation, it was about two years annual salary to afford a home. Our parents' generation, it was four years annual salary to afford a home. And today, it's about nine to ten years, depending on what part of the country you're in, uh, nine to ten years salary to afford a home um, just by, you know, for comparison's sake. And to your point about the TVs versus, you know, homes and gas, certain things seem to be skyrocketing, but the Keynesians like to, to point out uh, the, the TVs are cheaper, but one of the things that they, they fail to, to recognize or to state is that look at all the things that have gotten more expensive. It's not just that it's, it's valued in fiat currency, which is deteriorating, but pretty much anything that has inflating prices is also, there's a three letter agency that is regulating that thing pretty heavily. The things that are less regulated or less under, under the direct regulation of a three-letter agency tend to be the things where technology actually does get to make them cheaper. So um, fascinating stuff, man. But yeah, I mean, that, that, that's what makes the powerful case for Bitcoin being this, this, this once in a, almost like a once in a humanity opportunity to free ourselves under the, the thumb of the, the fiat regime. Now, that brings me to this, to this question. Now, do you do you hold the parallel economy kind of in high esteem? Is that is that the Bitcoin standard if the world goes over to a, a, a Bitcoin parallel economy or a Bitcoin economy in general? If there's only a Bitcoin economy, what how do how do you value the um, the the relevance of the the parallel economy? I think it's. Um, I think it's uh, really the, the success of Bitcoin is going to come as a parallel economy. I think we're going to eventually have to run the world on a Bitcoin standard, and I believe this is inevitable. I know some Bitcoiners don't like to say it because they don't like to. Uh, they don't like to antagonize dollar people, 
And that's fine by me. I totally understand that you wouldn't want to say it. But in my mind, I don't think there's an escape of uh, there is an escaping this because so, you know some people will say, well, Bitcoin is just going to be huddled. People are just going to hold their Bitcoin, and it's going to be the equivalent of a saving account, but it'll never be the money that you use. And I just think this is a complete misunderstanding of the role of money and how money functions. And I explained this in Principles of Economics and also in the, in the fiat standard. What emerges as money is necessarily the thing of which people have the biggest cash balances. That's just what money is. Money is the good that people have in the most abundance, not in terms of its uh, number of units or in terms of the physical quantity that they have, but in terms of the economic value. And so the reason that gold became money is because everybody had a larger cash balance in gold than everything else. And so that just ends up necessarily making gold money. So it doesn't matter if you thought that seashells are better money because they have a nicer ring in your pocket, or if you thought that limestones or glass beads or whatever it is, is better money. It doesn't really matter. The size of the cash balances in seashells and limestones and glass beads could not grow because those things are very easy to create and they're very easy to uh, make into... Uh, their supply is very easy to inflate and so therefore the value doesn't get stored in them. So even if a vast majority of people wanted to store their wealth in these things, their cash balances are going to continue to leak value. They're going to continue to dissipate economic value Whereas the harder objects, things like gold and silver, are going to hold on to value much better. So a tiny minority that holds gold will witness its wealth accumulate and grow over time, whereas uh, the majority that holds seashells is just going to witness its wealth dissipate. And if the people holding seashells don't want to realize this or don't want to come to terms with it or refuse to uh, accept it or continue to insist on living in denial, that's fine. It's not going to change anything about the outcome. It's just going to continue to leak all of the economic value that they have and all the value that's left is going to be held by the gold holders. So the biggest cash balances are what will become money. That's really, I think, the reality. And so for me, for Bitcoin, I think Bitcoin becomes the world's money when it becomes bigger than the U.S treasury market. This is for me the finish line. This is when I would raise the, vit the victory flag. And this is something that I would argue with an, a no-coiner. I don't usually waste time talking to a no-coiner, but I would ask a no-coiner this. All of these people will say Bitcoin's worthless, Bitcoin's going to zero. All right, well, if Bitcoin hits at this point, I think the price would have to be something like one and a half million dollars per Bitcoin. If Bitcoin gets to one and a half million dollars, It'll be a larger market, a lot more liquid market than the U.S. Treasury bonds, which means that all of the world's hedge funds, all of the world's sovereign wealth funds, all of the world's billionaires, this would become the most useful form of money for them because they would be able to have most liquidity there. And so if they want to, you know, somebody like uh, Elon Musk wants to have $40 billion to buy Twitter, or the Saudi Wealth Fund wants a half billion dollars to buy Kylian Mbappe, um, then how do you liquidate assets in order to have cash to make a payment for something like this? You need very large liquidity. So you want to liquidate things that have a very big market. And there are very few markets where you can sell a billion dollars worth of stuff and not have the market collapse. The U.S. Treasury bond market is the biggest such market, and that's what makes the dollar the world's money. The dollar isn't the world's money because you are using it to pay for your coffee. It's not this kind of democracy where we somebody looks up how many cups of coffee are sold every day and how many of them are sold in the dollar, and then that the, the currency which sells more coffee gets anointed the global reserve currency. That, that, that's not how it works. It's the other way around. It's because the treasury market is the biggest market in the world, the dollar is the dominant currency of the world, and that's why the vast majority of people end up using the dollar or end up using dollar-derived um, 
shit coins, which are essentially the other fiat currency, which I like to call dollar plus country risk. They're all backed by the dollar effectively, and they're all just the dollar plus whatever drama is going on in your country. So that's really the finish line. That's where Bitcoin wins. And when, once that happens, the Bitcoin parallel economy is going to be bigger than the fiat economy. And then it's just a matter of time before we bury the fiat economy because the people left on it are going to be like the people left holding seashells or uh, limestones or glass beads effectively at that point. So for me, this is, I mean, the way to get to that is we need to have more cash balances in Bitcoin. And so the more people have cash balances in Bitcoin, the more likely they are to spend Bitcoin. And you, I mean, it's tempting to tell people to just go all in on Bitcoin on the day that they get orange pilled, but that might be a little bit dangerous because realistically, most people pay attention to Bitcoin at the um, bull markets. And so most people are buying in at the time when the market is very high and then it's going to crash. Now, I, I, I know from talking to people, I know that a lot more people have bought in the 2013 top, the 2017 top, the 2021 top than would be buying in the bottoms. So just because there's a lot more reason to look into Bitcoin at the top. And in fact, that's what makes it the top is because there's a mania going on. So, realistically, you might want to tell people just go all in on Bitcoin, although, realistically, it might be wiser to take an incremental approach that takes into account the fact that you have fiat liabilities. So, if you have a business or if you have um, your own expenditures, you need to make sure that you've got a few months of expenditures set aside in fiat in order to protect yourself from Bitcoin crashes because Bitcoin has crashed 70 and 80% before and it will likely do it again, I would say. So you want to always be prepared for that. And so for most people, that means that they can't get in with significant quantities into Bitcoin immediately because they need to secure themselves with fiat balances. And so it's a matter of accumulating your way into a large Bitcoin position. And that is the battle. We need to keep stacking sats until everybody's cash balances in Bitcoin exceed the treasury bonds. And to get there, we just need to keep stacking more and more. And so, obviously, I think businesses that run on Bitcoin help facilitate this in a sense that, so for instance, just like with my website, because I've accumulated enough Bitcoin to make it a significant portion of my wealth, that even though I can keep a little bit of fiat on the side, I still have the majority of my cash balances in uh, Bitcoin. That means that I am happy to accept Bitcoin and I accept it not as a gimmick. I'm not accepting it so that I could sell it for fiat to pay my bills. I mean, I do sell some of it because I receive probably most of my income in Bitcoin at, the, at this point, but I prefer to get Bitcoin because I put the majority of my savings in Bitcoin. And so I think as more in my case, because I run a business that is primarily targeted at Bitcoiners, it's mainly Bitcoiners who buy my book and my uh, courses. So it also makes sense because most of my clients also have a significant uh, base in Bitcoin. And so this is really what I see as being the way that this grows. As more and more people accumulate cash balances in Bitcoin, they become more likely to want to spend Bitcoin and more likely to want to accept Bitcoin in their businesses. And I'll say here, I think, to be honest, I'm not a big fan of the kind of, let's just uh, accept Bitcoin and then, uh, you know, let's let's try and orange pill this restaurant so that they accept Bitcoin and then hook them up to a Bitcoin payment solution that will then allow them to sell their Bitcoin and uh, get fiat. And then, you know, we'll have... Bitcoiners who are doing the same thing on the other side, which is they're selling their fiat to buy Bitcoin to go then sell the Bitcoin at the coffee shop. Effectively, in this kind of situation, if the majority of the cash balance of the business owner and the customer is not in Bitcoin, then all that they're doing here is just blowing away SAS on transaction fees and reducing the size of their stacks. They're better off stacking more SATs to get to a point where they can genuinely be spending satoshis 
rather than having to uh, go through this song and dance in order to make it um, in order to make it look like, hey, look, we are buying Bitcoin and we're spending Bitcoin. So ultimately, what matters is the cash balances, and we have to work up the cash balances and begin to spend. And so this is why I think these genuine Bitcoiner businesses that are built on conviction of we want to take your Bitcoin because we want to stack Bitcoin as part of our business treasury because we want to build a cash balance that's built around Bitcoin. That's what we need. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. And I think that that's a, a huge part of our strategy with the launch of this merchant section um, in the in the app. Is for, So for me, I also I have a, a chain of wellness studios in Southern California. Um, quite frankly, my... The, my my cash balances in my in my in my businesses are much higher than my my personal checking account, right? Because the, the expenses of my businesses are you know one hundred and twenty thousand dollars a month. So as I can as I continue to incrementally creep up, how much of that cash balance gets held in Bitcoin at any given time, or how much of our treasury? So for example, uh, for our our day to day expenses, we operate in in fiat. A hundred percent of our our savings account, hundred percent of our treasury is all in Bitcoin. We we don't save ever in in, in fiat, um, and so that continues to grow over time. So any operationally, uh, b- besides distributions that go to owners, operationally any profit that we operate at, it goes to con- to continuing to raise that that treasury threshold. And so, yeah, I think that for every business that genuinely gets on a a Bitcoin standard, you know, you have an individual, an individual like me that holds a certain amount of Bitcoin in, in my, you know, in my balances, but my businesses hold maybe three to four times more just because it operates at a much higher scale. So behind every Bitcoin business is probably a genuine Bitcoiner as well. And that's our goal. Yeah. It's not to just, just not just to convert the nominal business. That's going to do it as a gimmick because that doesn't really further the cause, but we believe that, if we can create an actual circular economy in a given area, then businesses don't have to opt out or they don't have to sell their Bitcoin if they get it. Or even if you do start to get new businesses um, that that might not be fully orange filled, but they see that there are places to transact. You know, if there's other businesses that they can buy supplies from that are operating in this parallel economy, then they can start to recognize, well, I, I don't have to get out of my Bitcoin and they can. They only. Don't, they don't have to be fully orange filled. They only have to see Bitcoin as a better tool for savings, right? They don't have to fully understand all of it, but from an operational perspective, they can say, "Well, this is this is a good savings device." And if I still have the, the ability to spend it somewhere, um, and now it's it's kind of like building a plane while flying it. You have to get business to businesses to get onboarded and start to hold it in their cash balance, so that other businesses can have places to spend. It's building out a network. It's a very complicated thing. But I think it starts this way, and I think that that's why we're so excited to to launch this thing. So that we have a tool, we have a, we have a, a base of infrastructure where businesses can say, okay, it's easy for me to connect with my customers who want to spend Bitcoin, and it's easy for me to connect with other businesses, other merchants who I might be able to buy supplies from. I might be able to do my taxes through. Uh, you know, when, when I have an electrical problem at my business, I can hire an electrician that takes Bitcoin. That enables the businesses to stay in Bitcoin and not have to opt out of it. So I think that this is a really, really important factor. Um, but Sabadine, we're 12 minutes past what we should have gone past. I'm, so, I'm sorry we took up so much time. I, I know that, that it's probably been a long day for you. Um, I have to just end with this question and, and then you, you're more than free to, to, to take off. Um, you've been on Orange Pill App for probably about, about six months now. And... Uh, I just have to ask you, what has your experience been, you know, interacting with the plebs through Orange Pill app? Um, I'd say it's been generally positive. People are, uh, people are uh, very friendly to me, as you can imagine. <laughs> I mean, uh, a lot of people have read the Bitcoin standard, so I get a lot of messages of people telling me that uh, they like my book. And uh, I'd be lying if I said I don't like it, obviously wanting to make something that people enjoy is a huge, huge, uh, huge motivation on life. You want to produce something that people value. And uh, if you can do that, you get a huge amount of satisfaction from it. So I'm very happy about it. And it's great. I think it's great that uh, Bitcoiners can connect uh, and meet up locally. Because, I mean, I, I, I think everybody 
everybody who's a Bitcoiner has experienced this. Suddenly, all of your fiat friends become boring when you get into Bitcoin. All of the fiat things that you usually talk to them about just become less and less interesting. Perhaps the one exception for me is football. I'm still a football freak. That's the one fiat thing that I have not uh, managed to get rid of. Uh, soccer for the Americans. Uh, but uh, generally, it's, uh, it, it, it's, it's hard to continue to live the same social life that you had before Bitcoin because your time preference plunges. And so you start thinking about things that matter more to the future. And then you look around and all your friends are still talking about all of the uh, irrelevant, inconsequential bullshit that would be forgotten in a couple of weeks. So you need Bitcoiners. You need Bitcoiners in your life. You need to start a meetup. <laughs> you need to make friends. And you need to get together with the Bitcoiners and laugh at the no-coiners together. It'll make you feel a lot better and a lot less lonely. So I highly recommend it. That, that's going to be our new saying on the uh, homepage of our website. We're going to be <laughs> quoting you. Just get together with your friends and laugh at no coiners. That's that's the, the core competency of, of, of Orange Pill App. So, yeah. Seyfedeen, thank you so much, man. Uh, you gave us more than more than the hour you promised. And, uh, you know, we would love to have you back again at some point. And, uh, you know, certainly if you have another book out at any point, I'm going to be the, one of the first ones to uh, have it on the pre-order. Guys, uh, for authors, one of the most difficult things, Seyfedeen doesn't have seem to have a problem with it, uh, getting reviews. But one of the, the things you can do to really bump a book like he was talking about, putting it up at the top of the algorithm so that more people... They, when they're searching for economics books, it puts his books in front of more people's eyes. Go give it a review. If you have read any of, you, you don't even have, you could have bought it through Consensus Network or another book distributor um, or directly from Safe. But if you go on Amazon and review it there, you don't have to have bought it directly through Amazon to give it a review on Amazon. So please go out, review any of the books that you've read by Safedine. It really, really does help. It actually is a, an action that helps promote Bitcoin just by that simple thing. So anyways, uh, Safe Dean, do you have any closing remarks for the audience or uh, any last thoughts? Well, I mean, um, I'd be happy to take a couple questions. I think uh, maybe some people might have questions. I feel like um, I kind of uh, should take questions. So uh, do you want to bring up a couple I, people? I would talk? love to. Thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, there's a couple of people that had their hands up. We got... Uh, he's coming on stage right now, Brown. Whenever you're connected, Brown, you have the first question. All right, Brown. I think you're connected now. You have the first question. Go ahead, my friend. Uh, hi, Safe. Um, I had a, kind of a question about your point. So, do you, so do you think it's not worthwhile to try and, um, you know, let's say you do Orange Pillar Restaurant to host your meetup. It, you know, is it not worthwhile to accept Sats, or do you think that, you know, the main message is to build one, or, you know, one, one business at a time? I, I kind of don't. I, I'm a bit lost on that. I mean, I just think if you're going to be, I, I, I've been seeing people do this for many years. And realistically, if they're going to start taking Bitcoin because a bunch of customers are nagging them about it without them understanding the value proposition, without them wanting to actually stack sats, without them having a cash balance in sats, then they're going to do it as a gimmick for a couple of months, maybe a couple of years, and then they're just going to forget about it. This is, I think, has been uh, the experience that I've seen all over the world. And I've heard it from so many people. You know, back in 2014, people were getting excited about their local bar taking Bitcoin or whatever. And then eventually, I mean, look, if you're running a business, you can't afford to be doing this as a gimmick most of the time. I mean, you're going to be hiring uh, new bartenders at a bar and then you're adding an extra bunch of training to each new bartender. We need to explain to them how to do the Bitcoin payments. And then you need, you, you're need you incurring uh, FX risk if you hold on to them and you want to sell them. And most people just end up using uh, solutions like BitPay. I'm not sure if BitPay is still around. But they use something like BitPay that just converts it to fiat immediately. So it just ends up really adding friction 
So I, I would say the focus should be on getting people to understand the value proposition so that they want to stack SATs. If they want to stack SATs, then they will happily take your Bitcoin. They will want you to pay them Bitcoin. And then, um, I mean, I don't condone or support this, but, you know, <laughs> there are some benefits to taking Bitcoin uh, if you do, if you know how to do it properly, that um, I don't want to publicly say because they're not <laughs> good. You can definitely not do them, but I think you can know what I'm talking about. And so once they get the value proposition and they want to stack SATs, then it makes sense for them to just go ahead and do that. And uh, that's going to be the sustainable way of doing this in the long term rather than um, doing it as a publicity gimmick. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for doing that. We're on the same page. I get, I get you. Thank you. Cheers. Yeah, great question, Devin. And, and one of the things that is a big feature that we really, if you guys are going to businesses that you know are Bitcoin businesses or, or potentially trying to orange pillow business, one of the features that the merchant's account has that solves a lot of this problem is that their Lightning Wallet attaches to their profile. So you never have to deal with walking into a Bitcoin business that can't accept Bitcoin. I think that's one of the common things. People were happy to put their, their business on a website saying, yes, I accept Bitcoin, but only if the owner's in and he has his Lightning Wallet on him, could you actually send it? No, you can actually send it directly through their merchant account. And so there's, there's kind of a point of sale directly built into this process. In addition to, there's you know a lot, a lot more infrastructure being built out in terms of physical terminals and things like that that are helping simplify this a little bit. Um, maybe not a, a you know maybe not to the point of where the, the where everything's streamlined on the fiat standard, right? Everybody understands how to use a credit card and things like that. Um, but it's getting better and better uh, by the day. Um, Nico from Consensus Network, you have your hand up. Go ahead. Yeah, I just wanted to. Um Stop by and say hi, hey, Saif. And uh, yeah, I, I do think it's worthwhile uh, with some reservations to Orange Pill. Personally, I usually only Orange Pill places that I frequent myself because I have a vested interest in, in their success. And uh, I just want to share one inspiring story from Madeira Island. There's this place called Chao Pizzeria, best pizza on the island. Great proof of work guy, Ricky, runs it. And the way I got him was I or organized the Orange Peel app Pizza Day uh, when, when the last Pizza Day was. And uh, I didn't really talk to him anything about Bitcoin. I just said, like, hey, um, I'm going to bring you 20 clients here. We're going to have a bit of a meetup. And then he was super excited, of course, to get the, get the business. And then the last thing I told him was, like, oh, by the way, we're Bitcoiners. And it would be really great if you could uh, accept Bitcoin. It's like, oh, but I don't know anything about this, and I'm not interested in that. So, don't worry, I'll take all the risk off, and uh, I'll install the wallet on his phone, and I told him I'll cash him out anytime, which I did. And uh, it was a success. We had like 25 people, more than I promised, and we started paying with Bitcoin. I put it on btcmap.org. Um, I kept going there, bringing people there, and cashing him out. And then one day when I went to cash him out, he said, like, he got look, um, I'm not interested in selling anymore, so you don't have to come and cash me out. And that was like a, a huge win. That was the first time it happened to me. So, so there is hope that this, this will happen. And, and uh, the Sweden deal, uh, once the Bitcoin dipped, like a couple of weeks back, I called him and, and asked him again, do you want to cash out now? He said, no, I'm good. So that was pretty sweet. Just wanted to uh, share a positive story like that. Nice. Yeah, Nico, thanks for sharing that, man. I appreciate it. I'll, I'll kick over the last question to, uh, sorry, oh, <laughs> um, I, it's cutting off your name. Sorry. Oh, go ahead, man. Hi, everyone. And my name is Ofense. Uh, I'm from South Africa. Um... My question basically is just for Asafadin. Um, what I'm trying to do with can you can everybody hear me? Because my network is kind of terrible. Yes. Yeah, we can hear you. Okay. Um what I'm trying to do right now is like onboard schools and 
show the kids in the school like around my area what bitcoin is and how it works right but what i've noticed is that uh, a lot of our education system is basically run by Keynesians and everything so and Seth again said he one of his favorite books is the economy the not the bitcoin standard but the principles of economy so i wanted to know for like introducing kids more like cuz for me i feel like it's going to be better if you introduce it to the young ones much they're going to get it much faster than the old people are or businesses because of most businesses especially where i'm from they rely more predominantly on cash so they don't like even using their own bank business uh, bank cards or all those things so they are not too digital yet so fiat is kind of like a no go for them but then the young ones kind of appreciate technology and they are always on their phone so bitcoin is easier for them to, to absorb and learn so for me i wanted to ask sefadin does he publish his books or does he know anyone can publish his books in foreign languages uh, predominantly languages that are in south africa or like um stwana all those stuff and where can we get those books yeah well um so nico who just asked the question before you he runs a thing called consensus network and they have been producing translations of my book my books and many other books mainly bitcoin related books in various languages but of course uh, the way they work is that they work through a team of uh, people who speak the language so nico will handle managing the project but he doesn't speak all the world's languages so he need a team of translators to be working on preparing those things now in the case of the bitcoin standard it's a little bit more complicated because we have to buy the rights from wiley which is a little bit more complicated whereas with the principles of economics and the fiat standard you just i, I can uh, sell the rights myself and so that's much easier to do but um i think uh, you 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 need to get a team of translators if you can have a couple of people that are interested in working on translating the books they'll um, do a bunch of chapters each and they'll review each other's work then that would be um great do email me and we can discuss it in detail i i i'd be delighted to help in something like this and you're right i mean i i've considered i've been thinking about this for a very long time to produce a children's versions of my books but um i've just been so busy and swamped with the books themselves and writing new books that i have not had the clarity to sit down and produce uh, abbreviated versions but um the more people who nag me about it the more likely i am to do it so you're definitely doing the right thing here <laughs> oh i'll be delighted to help out on that and i i, I speak four languages from my country so and that's why i think you know you know that's a bitcoin match angora uh we've also yeah. been talking to him in, in this with this kind of things so i will i will shoot you an email straight up and then yeah man, i don't mind pulling in my work and saying let's do this cuz that's something i want to do from like inside of my area awesome sir thank you so much thank you right. <laughs> man that's great man anytime we can uh, have a new frontier that's awesome okay so i said that that was the last thing but i got to kick it over to my man daniel prince real quick he just dropped in daniel please say hello say so, thank you doing, brother I'm good my friend how are you very very well very well uh, I'm sorry I could only join the last 15 or 20 minutes of this uh, this conversation but been listening in and of course it's uh, it's all very bullish and thank you again for everything that you've done for the bitcoin space all the work that you've done with your podcast and your books and your education I have benefited uh, you, you know first hand I I signed up to your course when you first started it in 2019 and it's been an integral part of my extended rabbit hole journey uh i i just wanted to come up and and kick a question over to you because you know it's a very uh, pertinent question right now i don't want to leave this on a downer but i would love to get your take on it uh is bitcoin currently under attack safe what what do you see with this spam this ordinals this time stamping and even taking it back to the the, the drive chain nonsense that was really kind of like revved up back in uh, Uh, the, the early part of this year where they you know they were trying to really start this kind of drive in um in Miami if you remember where we were both there 
so yeah, I'd love to get your take on that. Um, uh, don't get. <laughs> I hope it's not too dark, but the, the, these are conversations that that need to be that need to be had, and especially in open forums like this. So I'll kick that one over to you, and uh, and thank you as always, Brian, for being such a great host. I'll say, I think, I mean, I, I don't have any kind of substantive evidence that I could go about to say that this is part of a, a, a coordinated attack on Bitcoin. But I would say that if I wanted to attack Bitcoin, this would be a good way to do it because you are effectively crowding out the uh, use of, I mean, effectively what this is doing is that it is reducing Bitcoin's capacity for transactions by about 90%. For as long as this bullshit is going on and all of these mentally retarded children are trading mentally retarded things, then they are crowding out real transactions on Bitcoin, effectively reducing its space and therefore raising transaction fees. And that's, uh, I mean, some people like to put a positive spin on it in the sense that it is going to help us develop second layer scaling solutions, and that's true, but we don't really need to be delusional about it there's no i mean an important part of scaling is that we are um is, is that we use the an, an important part of scaling is that we use all of the um, resources that are available to scale as much as we can and so the notion that oh well it's good that we're giving up 90 percent of block space because it's going to help us scale. It's not really true because it would be better if we scaled with the 100% of block space being utilized because the more block space we have, the better for the economies. Um, so I don't think that this is, uh, this is good. And I find all of the people that are trying to put a positive spin on it and all the people that are saying this is good for Bitcoin, I think they're, uh, to put it politely, mentally retarded. And um, I think the, the notion that people are uh, uh, presenting this as if it's some kind of um, thing that's going to help Bitcoin because it's going to generate more fees for miners is absolutely idiotic. Bitcoin is not a miner enrichment scheme. And the point of Bitcoin is not for miners to make money. We don't need uh, bit miners to make money. And they... Uh, and. The idea that transactions being more expensive is a good thing, I think it's, you know, it's, it, it was inevitable. And I, it's something I discussed in the Bitcoin standard that eventually Bitcoin transactions are going to rise a lot. And there's no denying that. But that if we are witnessing transaction fees rise because of um, an increase in demand for Bitcoin, an increase in demand for Bitcoin transactions, then that's a good thing. But if we're witnessing it rise because of people who are using it for something that's not monetary, then there is no shame in saying that I don't like this and I don't want it. And of course, the the part that makes me more susceptible to uh, or more suspicious and paranoid, and of course, you can never be too paranoid in life. I just, uh, it's a good thing. It's a good superpower to have to be paranoid. Is the way that people try and uh, gaslight you into thinking that if you express any preferences about what goes on in Bitcoin, then you are censoring others and you're calling for censorship. And that's just so ridiculously dumb. The idea that uh, any preference about what happens in Bitcoin, as if Bitcoin isn't a peer-to-peer -peer network where everybody's a peer and everybody gets to say, you download the node software and you run the software as you want and you get to choose the rules on your software. Whether you can enforce changes on the network or not is a subject of consensus for the node, but it's not something that is off limits because of some moral code that we all agreed to. Uh, this isn't a Catholic marriage where we signed up to download the node software as it is and we agreed to continue to love and cherish it forever and no matter what happens. Um, we're constantly making changes to Bitcoin. There's constantly new filters being implemented and added, and there are constantly people finding new ways of using Bitcoin in different ways. Bitcoin software today is very different from what it was five years ago and from what it was 10 years ago. And so if there are technical solutions that can make this uh, go away, I very heartily recommend them. But at the same time, I'm also um, not, um, I'm not 
too worried about this stuff because I think ultimately um, there's there's a silver lining here in which which is that everybody who's going to get involved in this stuff is going to get so wrecked and it's going to be heartwarming to watch them. I mean, we've seen this story play out over and over and over and over again every single time with Bitcoin. Um, I mean, people like this present this idea that the Bitcoin maxis are these hegemonous group that have enforced this orthodoxy over what their vision of Bitcoin is. And these people are generally um, clueless because the history of Bitcoin has always been shitcoiners and scammers coming in, dominating the narrative, dominating the media, dominating mainstream media, dominating Bitcoin and crypto media, and constantly harping on about how Bitcoin's dead, Bitcoin's pointless, Bitcoin's broken, and here's my new shiny little shitcoin thing that is actually what's best. And this has been the case since 2013, 2014. It's been the case since the Ethereum scam came along. It's been the case since every single shitcoin scam and its promoters have all done the same thing. And, I mean, the, <laughs> the, the Bitcoin media has always been at the forefront of shitcoinery and at the forefront of saying Bitcoin's dead, Bitcoin's broken, Bitcoin's been ruined. We saw that with Coindesk. <laughs> Coindesk. They promoted the Segwit2x scaling solution and they presented it as this historic compromise where they got all the parties together and agreed to it. And of course, it all went to shit. And then, if you may remember, there's a stupid blog called The Block, which was um, promoted as if it is this high intellectual value uh, understanding of uh, and research service that is providing an understanding into the cryptocurrency space. And then everybody involved in that stupid scam ended up having all of their money but in FTX and they got wrecked. And then it turns out that FTX had invested in them and they got all wrecked. And we saw this with all the shit coins over and over and over again. Over and over and over again, the same story repeats. The people come, they make loud noise, and they tell us that this is the new thing. But ultimately, all of those things are shit coins. Whether it is Luna, whether it is uh, any of the other shit coins, and whether it is JPEGs and block space on Bitcoin, there will always be more, but there will never be more than 21 million Bitcoins. So everybody who's going to get involved is going to get wrecked. And even if it is an attack, then, I mean, look, nobody said that it was going to be easy. Nobody said that replacing central banking is going to be easy. And you know what? The world doesn't owe you a joyride on the way to hyper-Bitcoinization. You're going to have to suck it up, stack as hard as you can, and pay the transaction fees, and just out huddle the people who are attacking the chain, if it is indeed an attack. And if it is the central banks that are financing this, well, we can stay hodling longer than they can stay solvent with their retarded uh, fiat currencies that are continuously getting inflated. And if they want to keep destroying their currencies in order to spam the Bitcoin network, well then... Have at it. We're going to be sitting here and holding, and waiting for them to run out. And this is the uh, th this is the kind of stoic way of approaching this. Um, of course, in the meantime, somebody comes up with practical solutions we could implement on our nodes and filters. I'm definitely interested in doing things like this because you know it's a spam problem. Email has spam. Twitter has spam. Bitcoin has spam. I think Bitcoin spam might be more motivated because it has a lot of uh, it has a lot of enemies. A lot of people want to take down Bitcoin. A lot of people want to stop it. So nobody said that it was going to be easy. I still have to clear spam from my email inbox almost every day. And if it means that uh, my node is going to have a bunch of noise on it, that's fine. Who cares? It's not. It's it's. It's less bothersome than email spam in a sense that email spam shows up in your inbox and you read it sometimes and then you have to delete it. This stuff is on your node and you have to go looking for it in order to find it and you don't need to look for it like any normal human being who's uh, reached puberty. So it isn't that bothersome, but it is it is an economic inconvenience because it makes you pay uh, longer, uh, it makes you pay higher transaction fees, but... Uh, 
No one said it was going to be easy. Wow, what, a, what an answer to close out the show. If you guys are wondering how Saifedean went for an hour and 40 minutes operating at such a high level, he told you the answer at the beginning. He's not full of sugar. He's full of meat. He's full of steak, all right? Like, that, that's how you do this. Um, Saifedean, thank you so much. I know there's a bunch of other uh, guys in the audience that had a question. I'm so sorry we couldn't get to you. But the cool thing is you can DM them on the Orange Pill app where there is no spam. <laughs> so... The, 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 the high signal Bitcoiners on Orange Bill app are, are, are going to be uh, genuine messages. And that's one of the beautiful things about it. Um, spam everywhere else. Uh, for those of you guys in the audience, next Wednesday uh, at uh, 2.30 p.m., we are going to be doing another uh, X space. This time is going to be with Mark Moss. So I hope you guys can join us again for that. Um, for those, I, I got a bunch of DMs during the show. People were asking if Orange Bill app uh, takes payment in sats we absolutely do sats preferred you can go to sign up dot the orange pill app dot com if you're a brick and mortar business like i said before go to the orange pill app dot com slash merchants and get your business registered there as safety dean said we need more businesses who are willing to hold cash balances their cash balances in bitcoin that's how we get one step closer he gave us a marker guys one and a half million dollar Bitcoin means that we are bigger than the bond market. That's our goal. That's our that's our, our goal post. Let's nail it. Um, and like I said, every every business that you connect with is an economic connection that makes your lifestyle more anti fragile. Every rancher that I know who accepts Bitcoin, who I have an economic connection with. It makes me immune to the effects of the, the of when CBDCs roll out, right? If I under if I know where to uh, to, to find somebody who will repair my electricity uh, if, if if my power goes out and he takes Bitcoin, I'm more I'm I'm a bit more anti fragile because of that economic connection. We cannot undervalue the effects of economic connections a network is as powerful as its connections how many bitcoin connections do you have of course we're all hodling but do you know where you can spend that bitcoin if you need to that's what's before us today and uh that's pretty much it for today you guys safe you're amazing i this is um, i'm going to remember this conversation forever this is this is fantastic i'm so excited that the book principles of economics that my kids will read I get to say that I talked to the man who wrote it um, and the lessons and the, the meaning behind it is, is deep and profound. Thank you so much for that. This has been Brian Dement from the Orange Pill app. Guys, let's go out. Let's make in real life connections and let's Orange Pill the world. Thank you, Safedine. You have a wonderful day.